Hello my wonderful viewers and welcome to another episode of Betty Adams of Analyzes. Today we're going to take another look at Lost in Space, Season 3, Episode 3, The New Guy. Now, one of the main things I noticed was that there was a distinct change in the quality of the CGI animation for Season 3. And with all of the restrictions that was put on the filming of season three, it's no wonder that they were leaning heavily on CGI. And to be perfectly fair, a lot of these things could not be filmed any other way. There would be no way to film them with practical effects. But the where it really, really shows is that whenever a Jupiter is flying, the you can tell that it's a CGI model and not a realistic effect. Of course, I don't have, the CGI is fantastic. It's amazing. It's a lot of fun. You can just sit back and enjoy it. But there was something, I don't, I don't know if they used actual models or just a different type of CGI when showing the Jupiters flying in the previous seasons, but you can tell that there was a distinct change in how the show was filmed. The positioning of the actors, the size of the groups. It does not detract from the overall experience. You do get the occasional spike of nostalgia and you're like, I wish this wasn't so obviously CGI, but on the other hand, the robot CGI has dramatically improved. So this, the CGI on the long shots, on long action scenes, when things are happening over a wide distance, that's still kind of iffy. But up close on the robots, these scenes that have to be CGI and not practical effects, they are pretty darn impressive. And as some of us speculated, we're getting a lot more of the up close scenes with the robots. Now, this is the episode where I'm going to have to mull over it and see where the show goes with it and think about it some more, but this is the first episode where I had a slight qualm with some of the character behavior. See, I didn't like the way they were behaving, but I haven't had time yet to analyze my reaction to tell if it's because they were behaving out of character or if it was because... I just didn't like the decisions they were making because it wrinkled when they were taking actions against some of my fav personal favorite characters. So I'm going to have to think over that and get back to you later. But the main theme of this episode was fun. Now, very serious things happened and very serious issues were dealt with. But the episode kept making <laughs> references to other great movies. I saw a blatant reference to Indiana Jones that actually is plot relevant. A blatant reference to Star Wars, which turns a, an old trope on its head. Uh, and a blatant reference to Star Trek. Now, I'm sure there's more, because I think they wouldn't have just shoved in three once they'd shoved in three, but those three means it was absolutely intentional. I think what might have happened was there was a particular plot point that kind of had to happen, given the genre this is. They came to a point in the story where a situation happened where, I mean, you couldn't not reference Indiana Jones in this situation. And once you started that, it's only a short leap to referencing Star Wars, and again, it was very plot relevant, exactly the thing that you were expecting to happen from episode one because of the consequences of the actions of the characters. And then the Star Trek reference was just icing on the cake. Definitely worth a watch, and that's the end of the no spoiler section. So if you want to avoid any spoilers, this is where you stop listening. Go click below the video for the links to my book, Humans Are Weird. I have the data, and Humans Are Weird, we took a vote. Available on Amazon and, and from the author directly if you follow the instructions on the website. Now, let's talk nitty-gritty spoilers. Oh my goodness, I wanted more Scarecrow and we got more Scarecrow. And I this is not how I wanted the story to go, but it's one of those things where you need conflict for a story and you don't want a story to be too saccharine and you want reactions to be realistic, and it was, and they were. But as usual, we're following two different storylines. One, the adults and Scarecrow. Scarecrow in the danger system, and two, Robot and the Children on 
what turns out to be the alien homeworld. The aliens that built the robots have gone extinct, as we discovered in the last episode, and Will is exploring, after fixing the ship, Will is exploring the city, trying to find out more about them. And he finds a chamber, and that's when the Star Trek reference comes in, because you can hear the whale song playing, and it's actually these recordings of the Asalian speech. Joe also uses this interaction Will's having with this control center in a in a dead city to address the fact that the humans have been wrong about a lot of stuff. Specifically, they thought that the weird sounds that the alien technology made whenever it interacted with the <clears throat> human technology systems was feedback or incidental incidental energy wastes that happens whenever systems try to interact that aren't necessarily compatible with each other, but it turns out that was the alien language or something the aliens used to communicate. And so you have your general Dr. Smith shenanigans. She's on better behavior because there's not as many chances for her to make trouble. And there's some, Will forms an interesting alliance with her. I really, really think well, what, what I'm getting from this show is that Will's building up to make a heroic sacrifice at the end of the season, and Robot's still responding oddly. So add together to the fact that Will's building up this really intense concept of this duty he has to do, and the acknowledgement that they really don't know what they're dealing with with these aliens from Will's own lips as exposition, I really think it's building up for a major plot twist where the situation is vastly different from what Will thinks it is and what, uh, the actions that he's going to take are also going to be vastly different from what he thinks they are. Who cares about all that? Scarecrow. Oh my goodness, we get a lot of Scarecrow and I really enjoyed it. Scarecrow is really exploring. He's looking at the human. And since we know that he's occasionally in contact with Robot, we know that he's had some communication with them. And this show just straight up lampshades that he has his own agenda and we don't know what that is. And this seems to be what drives what is actually my only qualm with the writing so far, aside from the minor times it ignores physics in the favor of telling a cooler story. I'm talking about the writing of the people. John and Maureen seem to switch emotional perspectives. Now this is something that longtime married couples will do. They, when hashing out a something they're unsure of between them, one will argue one side and then one will and one will argue the other, and then they'll actually switch sides to. Tr if this is something that healthy long-term partners do because it allows them to see the perspective from both sides. And in this episode, John is the one who's being. It seems to be more suspicious and more harsh towards Scarecrow, and Maureen has given in to sentiment, and I, I'm not sure if this is a reversal of their usual roles, because John was more empathetic towards Robot than Maureen was, but it was always because John was watching and calculating and trying to figure out what Robot was doing. And John came to conclude over time that Robot was more than not a threat to the family, that Robot loved the family and would protect them at all costs. And John had significant physical proofs of that from Robot. John has not had that kind of thing with Scarecrow other than that Scarecrow did come back and save Will. This might be John's natural suspicion as a soldier, slightly exacerbated by the fact that he's been under this emotional stress. And whereas Maureen just up and trusting Scarecrow, it might simply be, on the one hand, another expression of her myopic and narrow focus on her job, causing her to just kind of file away the people around her in terms of how they're useful. And once she thinks Scarecrow's helping them, he's just filed away in that slot. But she really does reach out and try to communicate with him this time. It fails rather miserably, or not fails. It was probably a good gesture on her part. It just is not the gesture that she thought it was. And that does show some character growth for her. She's thinking of him as a person. And I suppose her talking of him, talking about him as a machi machine earlier in the episode 
two might have been just habit for her, but it is, it's either a glitch in the writing, a slight failure to write the characters consistently, or it's really good writing and showing character growth and character development and simply revealing characters reacting under different sets of circumstances. So I'm not, I'm not really sure about that. But then, okay, so it was quite a significant, I guess you'd call it a plot twist. It is a standard plot element. It looks like there's a double cross, but it turns out not to be a double cross. And he is definitely at odds with the silver robots. They do not like him either because turned traitor or for some reason before. Remember, we still don't know what happened to the alien planet. There was pyroplastic dust, a volcanic event. The same thing that happened to Earth, which is an interesting parallel. And I don't think that's going to be end up being a coincidence. Especially not with all those alien bodies scattered over the stairs. So those are the themes. Trust, betrayal, hope, misunderstandings, and gestures of good faith. It was, a, it was an interesting and enjoyable episode. I'm really looking forward to the next one. I gotta say this is the first episode that had my heart pounding and super excited to find out what happens next. So well, that's it for episode three. If you like what you heard, click that like and subscribe button to share the video. And if you want to, if you want to hear some more from me, you can check out my book, Humans Are Weird. I have the, the, the data and Humans Are Weird, we took a vote, available from the author if you want to order an author signed copy. And peace out, my wonderful viewers. Humans Are Weird, we took a vote, and Humans Are Weird, I have the data. Two books in a series of human absurdity. Go check out these short story collections. What will our little green friends think of us when we finally do make it to space? Find out the answer in two books of human absurdity. Humans are weird, we took a vote, and humans are weird, I have the data. Available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Kobo and Google Play.